Well, in this talk, I'm not going to be directly concerned with variational algor algorithms per se. I, I do want to, to show you a couple of examples of how noise affects parametrized circuits um, that have this, you know, a specific, a specific structure. And hopefully those examples will be sort of dramatic enough that you will stay until the end of the lecture. Um, but for, before, before I go there, I, I uh, need to emphasize a couple of points about um, these sort of variational algorithms. And that is um, the fact that cost functions that are given by parametrized quantum circuits, uh, you can view them in as generalized trigonometric polynomials just by sort of expanding um, um, the parametrized unit trees. And what that means is that um, uh, they have a Fourier decomposition uh, that has a, a um, bounded sort of frequency spectrum. And sometimes from the structure of the, the circuits themselves, you can, you can see, you can sort of deduce the boundaries of this, this spectrum. So um, this, uh, so by saying that, you can sort of look at how noise affects a class of parameterized circuits by, by just looking at how, yeah, how the um, sort of Fourier coefficients uh, change uh, when you run uh, things on devices, for example, and how um, both the co Fourier coefficients and the spectrum changes. So, okay, let's look at the promised illustrative examples first. So, um, yeah, it's got to be an error, now, of course. So, um, here you have, on the right-hand side, you have the Fourier spectrum for, uh, so this is a 16-qubit uh, circuit that um, corresponds to a, a QAOA um, um, parametrized circuit. So that's uh, similar to VQE, uh, only um, it aims to um, uh, minimize a Hamilton, an Ising spin Hamiltonian that encodes a combinatorial optimization problem. So maybe the details are not, are, you know, are not necessary for, for this example. But you can see that, you know, in the exact simulation, you have a very clean, uh, you know, a very nice looking spectrum. But if you look at, the uh, at what the device spits out, some of the Fourier coefficients have sort of contracted, but you also have like additional, additional modes that, uh, well, that's not a quantum error. Okay, so you have additional modes coming from like the, you know, calibration error, non-Markovianity, uh, and so on. Okay, so what's, what happens if we increase the depth? So this is, uh, damn. so this is uh, a one layer, and uh, let's, so if you double the, if you double the depth, and I'm sort of looking at the different sort of spectral resolution here, you can see that uh, the uh, noise-free spectrum doesn't look uh, anything like the, um, you know, why is this happening? This is happening because basically uh, um, you've, you're reaching uh, the sort of coherence limit of, of your device. So uh, basically, you know, if you look at a simple sort of, sort of toy model where you um, just after every uh, layer, you apply a global depolarizing uh, channel. So that's sort of making your input state more mixed by mixing it with uh, some uh, probability p with uh, the maximally mixed state, then essentially, um, you know, like after many, many rounds, the expectation, noisy expectation value will sort of decay exponentially with depth. So you can do a uh, back of the envelope type of calculation that sort of limits, limits the sort of the, the depth that you can, you can go to to the inverse of this um, uh, depolarizing error, which you, uh, which you can, uh, we, we, you can, in principle, we can relate it to error rates in devices, but you know, keep in mind this is just a very simplistic toy model. And there are some nice um, works, uh, very works that are formalizing these ideas using entropic inequalities and uh, basically determining the maximum depth at which point your state becomes so mixed that uh, essentially the approximation uh, error in, in the energy estimate uh, can be simulated uh, with, um, you know, with a possibly a different class, uh, a different classical state. Um, okay, so some other ways in which noise affects, um, in this case, uh, the energy landscape of algorithms is um, 
uh, this idea of noise-induced barren plateaus that's been a lot of work done in the sort of Los Alamos group on this and should uh, sort of point out that, um, you know, so basically this has the effect as you increase the problem size of uh, um, and that you want to run, uh, you know, variational type of algorithm, uh, the energy landscape, or the optimization landscape becomes, becomes flatter as uh, sort of noise builds up throughout the circuit. Circuit. And this issue is uh, sort of different from other trainability issues um, that happen even you know, you know, without any noise at all, and they're related to sort of concentration of uh, the cost function that uh, has sort of exponentially vanishing, vanishing grades, um, and sort of a couple of different uh, ways of getting that sort of behavior. Okay, but uh, this is a, a talk about how you deal with noise and uh, how you do that. You can do that with a sort of combination of software and hardware. And you've heard already a lot of, about how, you know, optimal control and compensating pulses, dynamical decoupling, and adding, and adding other, other sort of noise suppression uh, techniques at the level of hardware uh, sort of can, can give you, you know, better devices and that ultimately affects applications that you run. Uh, you can also, um, you know, do uh, uh, improve uh, sort of the um, the quantum compute time by uh, at, at, the, at the level of a circuit. So you can, um, the, uh, Chika mentioned uh, before about com compilation compilation of uh, of circuits, so decomposing the circuits to uh, the native gate set and the arc architecture with all its constraints. And you can add on top of that um, information about uh, errors error in your architecture to, to sort of avoid, for example, qubits or interactions that are, are, uh, have, have a very high noise, noise level. Um, uh, other sort of methods, and I want to sort of briefly uh, um, say a little bit about, is um, tailoring, um, tailoring uh, one type of noise into another. So, um, this can be done with techniques such as frame randomization uh, or Pauli twirling or randomized compilation. They're sort of uh, the same, kind of the same thing. Uh, and the idea here is to um, um, convert a coherent error into a stochastic error. So into, uh, um, you know, a, a type of channel that some Pauli error happens with some probability. and. Um, that type of error, uh, there are many reasons that are nicer to deal with in general. So one way of, of tackling this is also is sort of a circuit level type of approach where, you know, this, this uh, kind of example circuit over there, if there is no noise, what's doing is just implementing a, a CNOT gate. Now, uh, what you do, you add uh, single Pauli operators and then you apply your CNOT and um, basically uh, apply a possibly a, a different set of Pauli operators that, so that it, they basically sort of commute, commute through and to identity in the absence of, if, if there's no noise. But if it, there is noise, the effect of this, if you randomize over all different Pauli, Pauli operation, operation is that, uh, for example, coherent, coherent errors will turn into um, stochastic Pauli errors. So, so yeah. Yeah. The, yes. Yes. So, so for example, um, uh, uh, quantum error correction codes—they are based on uh, correcting a uh, Pauli noise, and so this will. So that's one mo motivation. For example, another motivation is that um, the difference between uh, basically, error rates that uh, you, you um, uh, compute on your, on your device, and those error rates are based are average. You, you know, they're based on randomized benchmarking techniques, and they give you average error rates. Whereas uh, threshold theorems, for example, those are they those are formulated in terms of a diamond norm, and for, for in terms of a diamond norm. So it's a worst case type of type of error. error. So that means that you know, for the same level of uh, average. Fidel, average fidelity, um, the contribution of different types of noise, of contribution of coherent noise versus 
Pauli noise is different to this error. So, so it's basically uh, you know, a lower level of, so one scales with the square root of the average fidelity uh, and, one with the, and one linearly. Uh, yeah, so I, you know, it's uh, beneficial to transform coherent errors into stochastic errors. And a third motivation, uh, you know, probably like what, uh, is because we have some tools that could possibly work in there at the application level, and those are uh, essentially um, essentially tailored towards this type of uh, incoherent, incoherent noise as, as well. And uh, okay, and you also have the logical level, and you've heard a lot about that. And I'm not gonna, I'm gonna not gonna touch on that because this is, um, you know, a talk about NISC applications. So, um, um, what can you do at the level of application? So you can try and mitigate uh, um, errors affecting observables or outcome probabilities by. Uh, reducing the effects of state preparation and measurement errors, um, but you can also try and employ techniques like, uh, you know, uh, for specific types of algorithms. So, for example, if you if you know that the circuit you're running or the algorithm has a particular symmetry, then you can employ some post selection uh, to sort of map it to the to the, the right um, um, Hilbert space. Okay, so one uh, word of warning, these types of techniques, they're not meant to uh, produce states with uh, better fidelity. They are meant to um, uh, reduce the approximation error in, for example, uh, mitigate uh, in, in uh, the expectation value of the observable by employing uh, class, you know, classical post-processing. Post so, uh, okay. So let me give you like a, a general idea of how error mitigation for observable works. So the task here is the follow. So you have an input circuit, uh, you uh, with some number of uh, unitary uh, gates, you want up to UD, you have an input observable, and you want to produce a, a estimator that reduces the noise, noise bias when you um, evaluate this expectation value on a, on a device. And you can have a bunch of resource parameters that you can sort of, uh, um, it's good to keep in mind, and especially when you compare different methods. So, it, so you, these could be the total number of distinct, distinct circuits that you can, you can run to produce this estimator, the total number of shots that you use in, in, your, uh, in your computers, the, maybe even the sort of overhead in the number of ancillas for some methods. So uh, many of the sort of, recently proposed uh, uh, techniques to deal with um, you know, uh, error mitigation have a very sort of similar, sim they have a very similar um, building blocks and you can sort of separate them into three steps. So one is data sort of collection step where that's essentially what's doing there is doing some primitive form of noise characterization where you produce, you take your input circuit and you uh, have a bunch of processes that you apply to that circuit to modify it in a particular way, ways that are sort of method dependent. And you compute uh, expectation values of the you know, get observable or some, possibly some modified observable. And these modif this processes that modif modify your input circuit, you should view them like in, in general terms. In, for example, it, if you're familiar with in the quantum comps type of formalism. So these are like circuit boards where instead of states, you take in circuits and um, they output uh, other circuits that could potentially be on a different, you know, acting on a different number of qubits. So that's, so that's step one. And step two, so you, so in step one, basically you, you uh, run all of these modified circuits and you, uh, produce sample mean estimators for the potential modified observables you're interested in, um, and you collect that, that data. And potentially, you might also want to do some classical compute uh, for some of the circuits if they're, they're available. The second step is basically a functional model that tells you how all of this uh, data that you collect relates, relates to one another. And um, in building something like this, it's typically 
you come up with uh, a particular noise model that you think it's a good approximation of what's going on. And um, based on that noise model, you, you sort of come up with different types of functional, functional models that relate to these, um, uh, these data. Uh, and the final step is to use that functional model on the data you've collected on your device and via either some simple um, you know, summation, depend, depending on the method, simple summation or a classical optimization algorithm that determines the fit in that functional model, you uh, determine a, an error mitigated estimator. Um, okay, so this, you can sort of adapt this type, what I said in, in a number of different ways, including um, sort of adapted, adapted uh, sub-processes in the data collection part. So, but now let me give you an ex a couple of examples that uh, have featured a lot in the literature and uh, you will get a better idea what, uh, what these methods um, do. So one of them is uh, the zero noise extrapolation method, which bas basically relies on the idea that you can boost the level of errors uh, at uh, several different levels uh, of noise and then um, uh, use that to extrapolate to a zero level of noise. And the way you boost the errors, there are a couple of different ways of doing that. But here, uh, uh, you see that the process that modifies the circuit uh, is doing a bunch of, uh, uh, so, so some number of identity insertions. So if the, there were no, no barriers to compilation, then uh, you know, these, all, all of these circuits will, will just be the input unitary U. Um, but since uh, you know, errors sort of accumulate through the circuit, the you can sort of associate the level of, level of noise with the number of uh, identity insertions that you've applied. And, um, sort of, and there are different sort of function models that you can, you can think of. So if you consider an incoherent type of uh, error, error model, uh, and you expand that incoherent type, so like, you know, with some probability you have some error that you don't know about, and, um, um, and if you expand that in, say, Taylor series, you can come up with, come up with, a, uh, with a polynomial fit. If you look at uh, a global depolarizing noise, you will come up with something that looks like an, an, an exponential fit. Um, and so, and uh, the sort of error mitigated uh, um, uh, observable will be um, um, one of these, you know, like the uh, parameter, the fit param the parameter that corresponds to the zero, zero level of noise if you're extrapolating this to zero. Okay, so um, a second method uh, is, um, which is more, uh, has more of a machine learning flavor, um, involves, um, it, it relies on the idea that if you, you start off with a, uh, it, it relies on the idea that uh, circuits that have a, a well or a specific st structure have pick up similar types of, of errors. And um, um, you can, uh, from those, from those structures, you can replace some of the some of the gates that are hard to simulate uh, with gates that are easy to simulate. So you produce circuits that are efficient, uh, cl efficiently classically simulable. Um, so, for example, if you have a decomposition of your circuits into Clifford and T gates, that's a universal set. Um, so the Clifford gates are, uh, you know, the Clifford group is generated by C naughts. Uh, Hadamards and SK, so you have Pauli's in there as well, um, and, uh, T and the addition of TGs makes it into a universal, universal, um, universal set. So in your circuit, you have some T gates, or uh, more sort of specific to variation, or you know, have rotation by around around the z, z, z axis by some angle and you instead of uh, and you produce modified circuits where you replace uh, some number of those uh, non clifford gates with uh, the, their closest clifford gates so that could be either a z an s or its uh, its conjugate or identity so this produces a a series of different uh, different circuits and the idea is that if you have a um, um, 
sort of logarithmic number of T gates in your circuit, there are, there are, then you can sort of efficiently, efficiently simulate those, those circuits. Uh, and I think the state, sort of state of the art in terms of like computations is about 50 T gates. Okay, so, so that gives you uh, two things. That gives you a way of simulating what the exact uh, expectation values are for those particular circuits derived from the input circuit. So they have a similar structure. But they're, but they're classically simulable. So you have a both noisy expectation value and a classical expectation value. And basically you assume that there is a, a linear functional between, um, between the two. And uh, from, all, from all of those generated circuits, you can de determine the uh, fit parameters of this linear functional through, a, for example, a linear regression. And then you apply that uh, uh, to the noisy expectation value that you are actually interested in, so using the original circuit, and that will give you some error mitigated expectation value. Um, okay, Sorry. how am I? Yeah. Why it should be a linear? Um, yeah, there is, so like, for example, um, uh, going back to a depolarizing channel. Yeah, so if you, if you look at the depolarizing channel, it's just the noisy expectation value, value is, actually I have it somewhere, it's like one minus p to the number of gates times the ideal expectation value. Plus, if, if, it's, if the expectation value is not traceless, you have some extra, extra term. So that's one example why, you know, in, 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 if you're in that particular model, then uh, this type of metric would, would be exact, basically. Uh, but you're not, and uh, that's pretty much one of what I'm going to talk about next. Uh, how's, how am I doing with time? Uh, half, yeah, half an hour? Okay, okay, perfect. Um, okay, so, um, so I, I gave sort of the general idea of how, um, you know, the, how these protocols are constructed, but I should always keep in mind that whatever you're running on, you're not, so what, you should keep in mind that when you're doing computations on, you know, on a device, or you're not simulating things, uh, you're not getting expect, true expectation values, even if, even true noisy expectation values, but you have a sample mean, mean estimator that uh, is, has, so basically it's sort of a distribution that, whose variance uh, and that variance depends on the number of shots that you, you take. So the more shots you take, the, the better that appro approximates the true, um, uh, for example, noisy expectation value. And what that means is that in all of this, uh, these methods that I've, I've described earlier, the sort of data that you collect from your device is, is, um, has uh, some variance depending on your resources, so depending on the number of shots that you allow yourself to, to to take. Um, and the effect is that since the error mitigation is a sort of classical post-processing, it's a function of all of those, uh, of all of those sample mean estimators that co come from the different modified circuits. And this means that it has a variance simplification. So basically, in principle, it should give you uh, sort of the, the peak of the distribution should get, get you a bit closer to the ideal expectation value. Uh, but that's at the expense of a, of a larger variance. And um, so in order to produce, have the same precision as you would have if you were just running the noisy, ex, the, the, the sort of the bare input circuit, uh, you would need to, uh, to increase the sample complexity. And there are some fundamental limits to this, uh, including the fact that uh, um, uh, the, sample, the sample complexity uh, sort of will scale exponentially with the, num the, the depth of the circuit. Uh, so just to keep that, that in mind. So, okay, so sort of try to cover a lot of like the different methods and from a sort of protocol building theoretical point of view, but um, maybe you want to see how these things work in practice. So uh, to do so, let's look, uh, um, let's consider a couple of circuit classes as, as tests for these methods. So, okay, so he, what we have here, we have uh, 
random circuits. So basically, uh, you uh, have uh, you apply. So these circuits are similar to the kind of circuits you have in quantum volume experiments, and you pick up like two qubit um, randomly two qubit gates, um, uh, layers of two qubit gates, and you sort of repeat that. Uh, a second class is going to be what we call Pauli gadgets, where each layer is the exponentiation of a Pauli operator that you select randomly and with some, with some phase. So these types of circuits, they're the kind of circuits that appear in uh, dynamical simulation, for instance, because they, they sort of tractorized circuits look very, very, very similar to this. And so we're considering this and maybe keep in, keep in mind another class of circuits, which are mirrored circuits where uh, basically are constructed, uh, constructed out of these primitive layer circuits, only that you add a barrier to prevent compilation and you invert and you apply the inverse of, of that primitive, primitive layer. Okay, so the, the idea of mirror circuits is that they are, they are sort of, um, um, Right? So you have a, in the sense of, uh, you know that the expect true expectation value is going to be one by construction. Um, so it, they can provide scalable benchmarks uh, in general. Okay, and okay, so what we're gonna look at, we're gonna sample, sample just circuits from each of these specified classes and select some Pauli observable. In, this, in the case, case I'm gonna show you, that's gonna be a global observable and uh, determine uh, basically how much uh, the approximation error in the noisy expectation value has improved if you apply these error mitigation methods. Um, and you look at, sort of look at the median value over all these sample circuits. So what do you have here? Okay, this is emulation data. So like Chico was saying earlier, this is, uh, this is using a, a, a noisy classical simulation. So in this case, the noise model is a combination of depolarizing errors uh, corresponding to um, specific devices, uh, and so the calibration of, the, of some specific devices uh, that I'm gonna show you the real device data later on, and as well as some thermal relaxation and readout errors. So you can see sort of some, you know, the behavior you see here is something like you would expect, right? So uh, at some point you hit uh, a depth barrier uh, beyond which basically the uh, error mitigation has failed. So, so what you're looking at here, you're looking at, uh, let's see, so you're looking at for each, for various cubic numbers of qubits and depth, uh, you have each of these squares, re the outer square represents um, uh, a median value of the relative mitigation error and the inner, inner squares represent the worst case. Yeah, and if, he, if that relative error is one or larger than one, one, what that means is that the error mitigation has failed. It, do, it did not produce a better expectation value than the noisy one. Uh, okay, um, so let's see some, hmm? let's see some um, uh, device data. So the device data that we, we uh, sort of looked at, uh, used fewer sample circuits because of uh, sort of runtime limitation. So this is uh, uh, the example with random circuits. And on the top row, you have uh, a, a particular device, the Lagos IBM device, and the bottom row is the Casablanca device. So both of these have the same architecture, and we use the same compilation strategy, and be between the two devices, the same sets, sets of circuits are used. So, the, uh, and um, what you see here, there are a couple of features that you see. You see that even though the two devices have, in terms of the calibration data that was uh, recorded at the, when these experiments were, were done, the calibration data is sort of similar between the two devices. So, um, but, the, but when it comes to the performance of the er these error mitigation strategies, you see that there's a, there's a uh, quite a big difference in the sense that many of the circuits that we run on one of them, so on the top one, uh, did fail to improve the error mitigation, mitigation. So there are a number of different things that happen here. 
uh, that could have happened here, let's say. So one of those, so for example, you see here uh, on the top uh, left corner, here you have zero noise extrapolation. Uh, and the top one is doing exactly the same type of experiments, only on a different device. What could have happened here is that because we were using a digitized method where the uh, scaling of the noise was by in inserting gates, uh, that means that um, the, 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 the ABM Legos, the noise profile of the ABM Legos is probably quite be behaving quite differently than Casablanca uh, in the sense that, for example, this noise scaling doesn't, it doesn't, it's not doing what you would expect it to do. Uh, okay, and um, so, there are, so there are takeaway messages from here. So one message is that the emulation data gives, doesn't, at least the, the emulation, the emulators that we use doesn't give you, uh, doesn't give you a good indication of what the device is doing with these types of error mitigation methods. Uh, then, as Second thing is that you could use, in principle, mirrored circuits to, to say something about whether an error mitigation method for a specific circuit of a specific size and depth, depth is successful, but that, would, uh, that should be taken with a grain of salt in the sense that uh, it typically, at least in the experiments that we've done, it tends to overestimate um, the performance uh, on circuits that are not mirrored of the same size. Uh, okay, and we see some, some sort of similar types of features if you're looking at those PAWI gadgets. Yeah, so these look even a bit more dramatic. And I think that the reason why, why the Clifford data regression method here is doing, uh, is, is more consistent between the two devices is because it's a machine learning type of method. So it's not, so it's picking up things like crosstalk and, um, uh, and sort of correlated, correlated type, of, type of errors when it's doing the, uh, sort of uh, optimization to, to get an error mitigation expe expectation. Okay, so these are sort of the bad news, right? Can, can we have some, maybe some good news? Um, okay, well, what, what you can try to do, you can try to, before applying these strategies, you can try to tailor the noise model in a way that's more specific to how that, to the noise models that come into designing that specific method. So, um, you know, one way of doing that is if, if you're looking at, for example, parametrized circuits, you can, uh, uh, and you um, have sort of a, uh, not too many continuous, continuous variables, you can look at the noisy spectrum. So, like I showed you in the plots at the beginning of the talk, and what you can do, you can apply some signal processing to a particular uh, circuit families of parametrized circuits. So you can, for example, if you have some information about the frequency support, you can post select on, uh, on every frequency modes outside of that, that support through um, low high pass filters, or you can apply a threshold filter that will only select the coefficients that have sort of most significant, uh, um, you know, more, more significant value above, above a certain value. Um, so we, we, so we did these, some, these sort of experiments where we applied uh, Clifford data regression before doing this uh, denoising in the Fourier spectrum. And you can see some improvements. Uh, you can get uh, uh, sort of an improved energy, energy landscape that looks similar to the exact classical simulation, but still it's quite, uh, it, it didn't quite manage to fully um, uh, deal with all the decoherent noise that that's going on there. So you can, uh, you can sort of try and build up and, and uh, um, involve sort of purity measurements to sort of make this a, a little bit better. One other strategy that was uh, um, done in a, in a recent paper um, here from the, from the IBM group was to sort of look at um, um, combining circuit, circuit and gate level sort of error suppression strategies with these um, uh, error mitigation methods at the level of observables. And so the, the sort of application in mind here was a trotterized uh, sort of, so it was a dynamical evolution of a, of a transfer field Ising model on 26 qubits. And, and 
Uh, what you see here, so on the left-hand side, yeah. so the gray, sort of gray loop, uh, gives you um, gives you the total magnetization vector for uh, at different uh, trotterized steps. The um, uh, blue uh, sort of curve gives you the what you know the noisy expectation, the, uh, this, this noisy magnetization vector, which is built out of a uh, single Pauli. Uh, um, um, expectation values of observables. Okay, and what they were doing here uh, um, for the red curve, they were applying these, the noise tailoring technique that I told you that does frame randomization, so it converts coherent errors into uh, Pauli errors, a couple, and dynamical decoupling. So they sort of getting closer to the ide ideal expectation value. And then the interesting feature about this uh, these experiments is that they were comparing um, um, the outcome with uh, approximate with um, um, approxi approximate classical methods using tensor networks. So in this case, they were using PEPs, um, and uh, the idea is using this combination of dynamical decoupling, um, power twirling, and zero noise extrapolation, they could get a better, better performance than this approximate classical simulation. Uh, using tensor networks. So, of course, the, the regime in which these, this ex these experiments were done is a regime where you're st you, know, you can still classically simulate this. Uh, you know, it's, um, but it sort of indicates that if you, that there could be something there um, in terms of um, having, doing some computation that can beat a class approximate uh, classical uh, classical uh, methods. Um, okay, and you know, going further on, there there's some work in this sort of area trying to uh, bridge the gap between this sort of NISC and intermediate NISC and quantum error correction by combining these uh, the, the, uh, sort of error mitigation methods with quantum error correction. So basically, uh, it kind of set up what you're doing is you apply error mitigation to some, uh, so some gates. So for example, the T gates that, uh, you know, usually in a, in a surface cause, you will, they will require uh, overhead from ma magic state distillation. Those in these cases are sort of error mitigated and you have perfect Clifford gates. And you can do, so, you can play around with this different combinations in, in this way as well. Um, so, and, um, okay, so, um, if you wanted to play around with these types of methods and with de noisy devices uh, and in, in, until you wait for fully quantum error correction, there are a couple of toolkits that, could, can, that are available and that uh, do this, the, implement this type of method. So one is developed by the, the Unitary Fund group and some you know, community developers. Uh, and a second one has been developed by um, our, our, our teams at um, Cambridge Quantum slash continuum, um, and um, this, um, uh, the, the approach that we took is a compositional approach, so the software design uh, is, 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 has a graph-based type of architecture, and um, it has a, a variety of methods, including circuit, circuit level methods like randomized, like uh, frame randomization, and as well as the uh, sort of error mitigation for observables and spam reduction, reduction methods. Um, okay, so this compositional approach that we took sort of it makes it easier to apply combinations of different strategies and trying to, to understand what, what works better, better in this sort of regime. Uh, okay, and uh, to sort of conclude, I'll uh, kind of leave you with some open homework questions, I guess. Uh, so, um, you know, there are, there are you know, many things that you can ask in this sort of NISC regime, and whether um, the effect of noise restricts any computational quantum advantage, and by computational, I mean here, you want to produce some result that beats some, uh, the, you know, the best classical, uh, classical algorithm available at the, t at the time. That doesn't mean that people won't come up with better classical algorithms, but maybe at some point in time, you can, can you can you do something without quantum error correction that takes you in that regime? Uh, 
A second one is, one is if that is indeed possible for some very specifically designed type of problems and specifically type of calculation, what is the best sort of type of error suppression strategies and possibly mitigation that could help uh, get into that, um, into that regime? And a third question, which I have also seen it on, uh, surprisingly, in, in, uh, in, on t Preskill's Twitter, uh, in the list of questions after the Solvay conference, so it was quite surprising that that came up. But whether is the question of whether there is a smooth transition going from NISC into quantum error correction, and what kind of tools and techniques would you employ to get to get there? If you know, if you don't, assuming that does, someone doesn't come up with off the bat of a quantum error correct, a fully fault tolerant device that has millions of qubits in there. Which uh, yeah, okay. So with that. Uh, I leave you with some link that, so we're always looking for like good people to come work with us and this is just a part of the kind of stuff that we do regarding noise. There's a huge sort of increasing teams doing quantum error correction and it's a, Quantinium is a full stack uh, uh, company that does hardware, so it does ion tra uh, quantum computers using ion tracks and you've seen in some of the previous, previous talks. Um, but it also, it also does quantum cryptography, so uh, cryptographic systems, algorithms, quantum error correction, and uh, uh, you know, software, software development as well. Okay, so with that, uh, thank you, and I'm happy to take questions, and I hope I didn't overrun too much. <laughs>